I want you to know you're loved. And what a privilege to be able to be together this morning, look at God's word. And I want to say thank you to Pastor Reyes for asking me to be with you this morning. Let's do have a word of prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, we're asking that you would, yes, has already been expressed, speak to all of our hearts from your word, and I do thank you for the privilege to meet together with your people, people of like mind, and Lord, how we do ask that you would, yes, bless and anoint myself for this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra, chapter 9. Now, I'm certain there's not a one here that isn't a little sick and tired of all that's going on in this old world. And uh, you and I would like the Lord to just swoop down from heaven and wipe away all this disease and problems in the world and open up everything and the job world and schools and restaurants with a sign in them, everything half price. (laughs) And uh, we'd love to see the Lord do something great and sometimes we call it revival. And I want to just think on three or four or five things this morning connected with revived hearts. Now, Ezra chapter 9, beginning at verse 5, please. And at the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is gone up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, we have been in great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to a confusion fusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord. Amen. Our God, to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Verse 9, For we were bondmen, yet yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. In verse 9, we read, God hath not forsaken us to give us a reviving. Ezekiel put it this way, begin at my sanctuary. Begin in my heart, in other words. Now, revival is needed, and we are creatures of choice. We can choose if we desire to be revived or not. The title of the message this morning, Revival at Samaria. I'd like to just look at a few thoughts concerning things that took place in the city of Samaria. I don't know whether you'd ever thought of it, but uh, the Old Testament tells us there was a king named Omri, and he bought a hill named Samaria. But the Bible goes on and tells us that his sins angered the Lord. And years later on, they erected an altar to Baal there. 
Now, here we have things that I'd like to just look at, just a few things that I believe need to be in our hearts if we're to be revived. Go to Luke chapter 10 with me, please. Luke chapter 10. Here in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 30, you're familiar with this account, but my, how my heart's always warmed reading God's word. Luke 10 and verse 30, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he com had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Notice verse 36 and 7. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Yes, in verse 33 we read that this Samaritan had compassion. Compassion, that is, According to verse 37, he showed mercy. He was merciful. The priest passed by. This priest, according to God's word, was in charge of the temple. Then the Levite passed by. He was in charge of the altar in the temple. But it was the Samaritan that had compassion over half the times in God's holy word, where the word compassion is used, it's referred to our Lord Jesus Christ having compassion on people or situations. Yes, you and I as a child of God, someone who's saved, we're not revived in our hearts unless we have compassion. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Here in Luke chapter 17, I want to begin reading there in verse 11. <clears throat> Luke 17 and verse 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers and stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice, notice, glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, saying, or giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? That there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Yes, a certain Samaritan here. And uh, he was a leper, verse 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Notice something about this one that did have a thankful heart. 
He glorified God. And I want to say this morning that you and I, if we're to glorify God, we need to have thankful hearts. The scriptures tell us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I don't know what may come down the pike in your life, but I know that God has not made any mistakes with his children, what he allows, and we need to learn to say thank you to our wonderful Lord and Savior. We need to thank the Lord not only with our lips, but with our lives. Let people know that you're thankful and have a thankful heart. Yes, revival at Samaria, one that had compassion. Compassion. Oh, listen, it's not easy for you and I to have that kind of spirit. You see some person standing on a street corner wanting a handout. Listen, instead of being critical, why don't you pray for them and ask the Lord if they're not saved, they might get saved. I take a gospel track and put two bucks in it, and if I can, I give it to them. And uh, trust that they will read that track and their hearts warmed and drawn to Christ and saved. We need to have compassion on people. And uh, then there was one there, that leper, that was so thankful. Take and turn to John chapter 4 with me, please. Here in John chapter 4, very familiar portion of Scripture. Down in John chapter 4, and let's begin at verse 1. There's John 4 and verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, and the Bible explains that, it says, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, here near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. I understand that that well is 150 foot deep and 10 feet in diameter, dug by hand. Verse 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Drop down in verse 13 of John 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou, Truly, look at verse 29, please. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Down in verse 39, please. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did did. Yes, you're on your way to re a revived heart when you recognize the Lord Jesus knows all about you, knows everything about you and me. 
Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth them and forsaketh them shall find mercy. Are you willing to leave all sin and do his will? He knows all about you and me. The psalmist said in Psalm 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Yes, we need to recognize our Lord knows all about us. I believe when we have some of these Bible truths that we want God's will done in our lives and stand up to that we're on our way to revived hearts. And I don't believe without it we don't have a revived heart if we not have any compassion on someone. If we don't have any heart full of thanks and goodness. My, how God's been good to each one here. Not a one of us that hasn't been blessed by our Lord. And yea, how we need to realize, yes, Lord, if you know all about me, maybe I ought to just try and please you. And look at Acts chapter 8, please, with me. Acts chapter 8. Here in Acts chapter 8, we have a little another thought concerning what I'd like to feel needs to be in your heart and mine. Acts chapter 8, verse 5, please. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, notice, and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with Loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. Notice verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. Oh, listen, a revived heart, great joy. Our lives influence other people. Like I've said in the past, we need to have a smile on our face. Some people, in order to get a smile on their face, you'd have to stand them on their head. <laughs> and uh, we need to recognize that we need to have a great joy as a child of God reflecting the Lord Jesus. Romans 14 and verse 17 says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace. And notice, Joy in the Holy Ghost. Yes, the kingdom of God is the work that God wants to do in every heart. Oh, I know he's going to set up his kingdom and rule for a thousand years on this earth, but the kingdom of God, the work that God wants to do in your heart and mind is not meat and drink, but righteousness, being right with him, and peace, need to have a peace in our hearts, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. We gain strength when we just begin to be happy in Jesus. Amen. Galatians 5 and verse 22, you're familiar with that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, long-suffering and goodness, yes, joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, and joy. And uh, we need to show that in our Christian walk and life. Daniel chapter 6 and verse, 33, or verse 3, I believe it is, uh, we're told that Daniel had an excellent spirit that was in him, and he was preferred <laughs> above the president's and the princes. Why? Because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And you and I, to have a revived heart, need to come to a place where we really do have a spirit of rejoicing and 
Yes, uh, just not being beat down, but a smile on our face. And a good morning, how are you? And Boaz went out in the field, and you know what his workers said to him? Good morning, boss. <laughs> yes, we need to be a joyful people. You know, the book of Ezekiel tells us that when God's people came to worship, if they came in the north gate, they were to leave by the south gate. And if they came in the south gate, they were to leave by the north gate. And I'd like to liken that, that you and I ought to leave different <laughs> every time we come to the Lord's house. Be a little different. Yes, uh, by God's grace. Now go with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, please. Here in 2 Kings chapter 6, <clears throat> down in verse 24. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. It came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dung, dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. <laughs> Things were in pretty bad shape here in Samaria. Now go down to verse 3 of chapter 7, please. Here we see Outside the city of Samaria, they couldn't get into it because they were lepers. Verse 3 of chapter 7. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there, for the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and le left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Verse 9, please. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Verse 9 we read, 
these leprous men said, we do not well. Oh, my. Leprosy, of course, throughout the Bible often speaks of sin, a reference to sin, so to speak. And uh, here are these men, yes, they had problems. Your spiritual condition can be in some bad shape. But listen, dear friend, there is hope, just like portrayed here in this true account in the city of Samaria and surrounding it. There is hope. And, you know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In this business, we do not well. Why? You and I, if we know there's something that will help others, and we don't share it with them, we do not well. These leprous men, they were starving to death. People in Samaria were starving to death. Unimaginable that someone would say, hey, let's boil my child today and eat it, and we'll boil yours tomorrow and eat it. Things were in bad shape. You know, spiritually often, we can get in pretty poor condition, but God has an answer, and when we know what's best and what's right in life, we do not well unless we share it with others. And so they shared it with the city of Samaria, <laughs> and they were blessed and helped, revived hearts. Oh, listen, dear friend, just wanted to suggest those five things that took place in Samaria, revival at Samaria, the one had compassion, compassion. Let's ask the Lord to give us hearts of compassion. The other gave glory to God. He was thankful. Never lose sight of being thankful. You know, we saw where the Lord knows all about us. He knows everything about you and me. And then Philip, as he preached the word, there was joy. It's the word of God that changes things, changes lives. Thank God that Pastor Reyes has asked you and me to get into the Bible and read it through. You let him know I read Revelation, okay? <laughs> and... Uh, Oh, listen, dear friend, joyful hearts, hearing the word of God, but you can't get around those lepers. They said, we do not well. We aren't doing right unless we share with others. And what can you and I share? Yea, how to be saved, have everlasting life. Amen. You know, if we're going to have a revived hearts, sin must go. Sin in your life and mine as God's children must go. The real cost of revival is our pride and our selfishness. As I've expressed, the choice is yours and mine. That's, it's up to you and me. This morning, God's brought us together. I believe, just to share God's word and fellowship around God's word. Let me just suggest some things. Will you give up tobacco? Will you? Maybe it doesn't apply. Will you give up alcohol? God's word I read this week where God's word says wine and new wine takes away the heart, takes away a person's heart from living for Jesus. Will you give up the movie theater? I told you about years ago, about the last time I ever went to a movie theater, been 50, 60 years ago. You didn't know I was that old, but... Uh, <laughs> 
I, uh, my brother and I bought a Plymouth pickup for $110. You didn't even know Plymouth made pickups. And uh, I drove it to town that night and went to the movie theater. I wasn't used to driving because we never had a vehicle. When the movie was over, I walked all the way back home from that movie theater, across town, down an old gravel road, up Florida Road. And when I got to the top of the drive where our house was down there, big old two-story log house, still there, a beautiful landmark. It's so big, it has three or four apartments in it even now. And I realized that I'd forgot to. I drove the pickup to town. I had to walk back to town and pick up the pickup. But oh, listen, dear friend. The psalmist said in Psalm 99 and verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So much wickedness on television, other places. Excessive TV. Uh, be careful. I suggest these things. Why? Because we'd like to have revived hearts. Revival starts in the heart of God's children. Been mentioned backsliding. What is backsliding? The lost man doesn't backslide from the Lord. He, he doesn't know him. He backslides in his sin and gets worse, of course. No doubt, often, but you and I as God's child... We backslide away from God. We need to come back to the Lord. And I believe if God's people across this land really were revived, God might just swoop down from heaven and do that that we'd like to see, like to see him slap that wicked crowd upside the head. Amen? Yes. Oh, my. Would you give up what the Bible calls licentiousness? licentiousness, that's dealing with uh, illicit things that aren't scriptural sex-wise. And uh, you can't go to the mailbox and you open it up. And there's some picture of some half-dressed woman. <laughs> yeah. Turn on the TV over and over and over. By the way, there is something you ladies can wear. You can wear a smile. Amen? But I appreciate people that will set aside the sexual activity and things that come before your eyes and mine. Improper sex. Yes, we've mentioned compassion. It's needed in your life and mine. You kind of reap what you sow. Amen? Amen? Maybe a day when you and I might need some help and be compassionate. I've often told my preacher friend, uh, uh, he gets down on some lost people, and I tell him, well, now, if you and I jumped in our car and headed to Farmington, New Mexico, and it was 20 below zero and we broke down, <laughs> and that fellow that you're aggravated at came along, <laughs> we'd be glad to see him. And oh, listen, dear friend, let's not lose sight of compassion, thankfulness. The book of Hosea tells us plainly that sin takes us away from the Lord. Not having hearts of compassion, not being thankful. We need to confess our sin to the Lord, not being joyful. Hosea also tells us that sin takes away our joy. It'll take it away from you. Not doing right when we know we ought. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now this morning, revival at Samaria. Oh, I'm so glad to that city of Samaria, known for so many problems. But there have been times when there were revived hearts there. God's people 